could have come putting an into the veterinarian from the different region in the world. You are welcome to Sri Lanka Veterinary Association second international webinar series. <coughs> we have organized 16th webinar at this second SLVA webinar series. This is our ninth webinar. Today our topic is minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. Our resource person is Dr. Suranya Vijay Korn from uh, Veteran Teaching Hospital, University of Peradeniya. And our moderator is Dr. Tarindi Madhivela. Uh, without wasting much time, I would like to invite Dr. Susanta Malavarati, the President of Sri Lanka Veteran Association, to welcome you all. Dear President, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sugata, uh, immediate past secretary of Sri Lanka Veteran Association. And warm welcome to uh, all the participants and the resource person and also the moderator and all my ESCO members of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association for joining uh, this session. And as uh, our former secretary mentioned that this is the ninth uh, international webinar session. And I'm very happy that uh, most of our members are joining here to get their knowledge updated. And the objective of this presentation uh, or seminar series is to give the experience of uh, eminent uh, scientists of our veterinary profession to share their knowledge with our members and to uh, up, up, upgrade their knowledge and also to uh, discuss the important matters, practical, practical importance matters with the resource, resource personnel. And I'm very happy that uh, not only from Sri Lanka, there are many members from other association from foreign uh, veterinary associations are also joining here, especially from uh, India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, and also from other uh, European countries. So very good uh, morning, evening to all those who are joining from other countries. And uh, actually, uh, as a SLVA, we would have conducted all those sessions uh, uh, on, on physically, but the only thing is uh, due to the present uh, situation of the country and also the uh, convenience of the members, we have decided to go on virtual. So I think most of our members are benefiting uh, out of this session. And please uh, encourage your friends, uh, veterinary friends, to join this session because it is a uh, good uh, platform to update their knowledge. And today our resource person is uh, Dr. Suranji Vijay Kwan, uh, one of our senior lecturer at uh, the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Peradeniya. And uh, also she is the Honorable Secretary of uh, Sri Lanka Veterinary Alumni Association. And uh, welcome you, Doctor, to this session. And thank you for uh, taking, uh, being volunteer and taking the responsibility of conducting this uh, seminar. And also our resource uh, personal uh, uh, moderator is Dr. Tarindi Madhivela. Uh, you are welcome, Dr. Tarindi. And also thank you for being volunteer to moderate this session. And also all my EFSCO members and all the past presidents and the members of uh, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association and also other members from other countries. So I'll hand over uh, this session, uh, Dr. Tarindi, to you to introduce our resource person, Dr. Suranji Vijay Kohn. Today's topic is minimal invasive plate osteosynthesis. And I am very hopeful that our members will get their knowledge updated through this session. Over to you, Dr. Tarindi. Thank you, Dr. Susanta Malavarachi. Good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to moderate you the ninth lecture of second international webinar series organized by Sri Lanka Veterans Association. Today, our guest speaker is Dr. Suranji Vijay Kon. Dr. Suranji Vijay Kon, actually, who doesn't want an introduction, but it is my privilege to welcome her and introduce her to the audience. Dr. Suranji Vijay Kon graduated from Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science. Later, she obtained her MPhil from University of Peradeniya and PhD at University of Hokkaido, Japan. She was recipient of Japanese government scholarship in 2014 and fulfilled internships at Glasgow University and Washington University in St. Louis. She was a member of American Society, of, Society for Bone and Mineral Research. 
Her research interests include stem cell biology and understanding mechanism of action of disease modifying arthrosis drugs, while studying the extensive reciprocal interaction between immune and skeletal systems that obviously relevant to pathogenesis of bone erosion, senior rheumatoid arthritis, and similar disorders. Currently, she is working as a senior lecturer at Department of Veterinary Clinical Sciences, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science. Welcome, Madam. I would like to remind the audience that you can send your questions to our chat box and we will be answering the questions at the end of the lecture. Without taking much time, I would like to invite Dr. Suranji Vijay Kon, Madam, over to you. Thank you very much, Tarindi. Am I audible and visible? Yes. Yes, Dr. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, SLVA, for organizing the webinar series and having me today. I believe uh, this one hour will be a very dynamic and a productive session for every one of us. Uh, perhaps uh, some practitioners who are very fascinating about the orthopedics will know this technique very well. Uh, maybe they will have practiced this before as well. So the next 45 minutes, I will share my basic and the principles together with some uh, case discussions relevant to this topic. Uh, the most important thing is uh, I will call you all for a few warm ups sessions, time to time, uh, to bringing you a special slides, which contain few questions, uh, like uh, quizzes. Um, so you can earn marks. Uh, at the end of the sessions, we can share our final score as an individual, and we can uh, we can share each other. So, okay, so let's move to the science now. Uh, I, again, thank you uh, for organizing this series, SLVA, and good afternoon, everyone who, who are the participating today. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, within the last 30 years, the rigid fixations have uh, revolutionized wide range of treatment procedures. The principle of fracture management emphasizes uh, rapid return of pain-free functions following a, a fracture repair. And there are a lot of continuing uh, research in the area of fracture healing uh, led the chance in uh, philosophies and the goals of fracture osteosynthesis, uh, especially focusing on a minimal invasive fracture stabilization techniques. So the telling the truth, MIO, a minimal invasive osteosynthesis, is not a new concept at all for an orthopedic surgery. So that's why I mentioned earlier, so may have Perhaps the veterinary practitioners in Sri Lanka will know about this technique and they may have practiced. So a good example is close intermediality nailing or percutaneous fixation of the fractures using uh, K wires or the screws have been performed with the satisfactory results. Uh, orthopedic trauma surgery have traditionally attempted to minimize further trauma to damage area. So with that considerations, uh, minimal invasive fracture fixations was introduced uh, by a very old, uh, very ancient time to our society. So when it comes into the this slide, this is a uh, the, in, in here you can see uh, how old this one is is going the history beyond the third, uh, second world, uh, world war. So uh, the first uh, the doctor was invented in this kind of uh, plate was. Uh, a surgeon Dr. Carl and his team, and he developed this technique, uh, and that's what we are enjoying currently. So it's a great respect to him. Okay, so I will just move to the uh, the the basic uh, slides uh, hereafter. So eventually, I will go and uh, think at uh, the discuss about the principles and uh, fundamental of these techniques. Right, so the bone plates and screws are not a new things to Sri Lankan veterinarians, so they most of them are practicing now and using these techniques uh, to uh, overcome a lot of day-to-day uh, -day orthopedic uh, uh, cases. The bone plating is ideal for preventing uh, many of potential uh, fractures or orthopedic related uh, uh, matters, and uh, it will be uh, imposed on the fractures. And sometimes we are using a plate uh, always together with some uh, pins, and especially we are thinking about it on a tension side of the bone. Um, so basically uh, what I want to tell is, 
the why we are using this is uh, plates is to uh, uh, overcome the compressions or shearing and rotations and bending uh, functions. So, so we have to think about those potential forces when we are encountering with these uh, plates. Right. So this is a very, uh, very um, uh, severe trauma happening to the femur. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, so they have combined it with the uh, rod and the plates. That is how the tension and the uh, the compression was given to the bone and uh, reduce or minimize the fracture. Uh, so this is a, just an example to you to bring up and warm up you at the very beginning. Uh, so what is the indication of plates? Why we use the plate is basically uh, can be used to almost any fractures, uh, but there is enough bone length with the proximal and distal ends. Uh, it allowed to uh, for a placement of three screws uh, basically uh, on the each side segments engaging minimum three cortices. So that, so that is a fundamental theory of applying the plates. This general rule can be used to determine the length and the type of plates uh, that should be applied in any given situation. So keeping that in mind. Right, the fractures uh, we are classifying in a several names and we have a, a lot of type, several type of uh, classifications for that. And we are using a several diagnostic techniques to the fractures. I think we don't need to uh, go through in detail on those things. Uh, but the basic main thing uh, we want to highlight here is choose the correct fixation is really important uh, and uh, to identify the bone healing after the applications is really necessary and to address the complications. So those are the things uh, I want to uh, make sure that you are thorough on those uh, facts when you are considering the applications. So when it comes to the choice of the implant, so we have uh, several sizes, several materials, several uh, compositions uh, having in the uh, plates, screws, uh, um, uh, some nails and all the things, but everything is depend on the patient size. So we have to think about this. Uh, the sizes of the patients, location of the uh, uh, the fracture, sometimes the fracture configurations, uh, especially the surgeon's preferences uh, come over top of all the those things. Um, all right, so I think that you have a familiarized with this plate and screws in a different type of uh, uh, setup in, for example, conventional uh, plating was uh, already established and eventually it moved into the locking plates where they have a locked system. You could easily see here uh, the how the nail or the screw locked in the plates. Um, the interesting thing is the locking plates having a several advantages over the conventional plating, especially so there are less chance to screws to get loosened from the plates. You know, it's having a screws and it tightened very nicely. And that's why we call the locking plates are more stable fixative. Uh, and also the thing is, the important thing is, it does not uh, disturb the underlying cortical burn, bone perfusions. So that is why you could see the gap between the bone and the plate. Uh, that is it's really necessary to avoid the porosis in the bone uh, and uh, that eventually helps to healing fast healing. Right, so there are even uh, we use this uh, kind of uh, uh, plates, screws for uh, constructions uh, to the fractures. There are a lot of construct failures happening in our day-to-day -day life because of uh, several uh, malfunction of the plates, maybe compositions, and maybe uh, our wrong decision uh, on uh, putting the screws and uh, plate in the wrong places. And there are some other factors coming from the patient. So there are several uh, issues are uh, happening around this. Uh, fractures and maybe eventually uh, contamination can be happen and fail the all procedures. So we are wasting a lot of time to uh, construct this uh, type, uh, type of fracture, but uh, because of uh, uh, some other issues or environmental factor could be, or the surgeon factor, or maybe the uh, the, the implants we are using, it's maybe uh, having some uh, sort of problems. So eventually end up, up with this kind of failures. Uh, to overcome those uh, failures, uh, we have to consider several factors. As I mentioned earlier, the surgeon preference, surgeon experience is really important. Right, okay, so that's uh, at the very beginning, I told you that there are some quizzes to warm up you all. Uh, so take a piece of paper. So I will uh, invite all of you to take a piece of paper and the pen. And uh, shall we move to our first quiz? I think this is a very general one, but just to understand uh, just the type of fractures before we move into the real topic. Uh, so if you are all ready, I can uh, start up. 
so just give you uh, 30 seconds and get a piece of paper and write it down what is A, B, C, D, E, and F and give your marks by yourself. And at the end of the presentations, we will uh, get all uh, everything in it together. So the 30 second has started. All right, so you can uh, put it in the, your answers in the chat box as well. So anyone uh, welcome for that. Uh, so let's see the answers. Okay, so the first one is a green stick, fishers, and the third is a commuted and transverse, oblique, and spiral. So I hope you have done a good job. I think you are 20 marks now. Okay, so be back into our lecture again. Okay, so uh, there are several uh, fixatives we are using uh, for our day-to-day -day practices. That is one is internal fixators versus external coaptations. But the advantage of internal fixation is uh, it's uh, it's subject to the compression, shearing, and the tensile forces. And also it's good for commuted or long oblique fractures. Uh, and also it should, can't be, I mean, it cannot be reduced uh, if, if the fracture, you cannot be reduced approximately uh, to the applying to 50-50 rule. So you have to definitely go for internal fixation uh, so rather than going for the external fixator. So what is this 50-50 uh, rule? Have you ever heard about this one before? 50-50 uh, rule is uh, uh, it's a kind of like uh, measurement uh, to get understand about. Let me show you. Uh, if the fracture cannot be reduced at least 50%. So if we cannot reduce the fracture by 50%, some type of or any sort of internal fixations we have to apply. So that means at least there should be a 50-50 contact between the both ends of fractured, uh, fractured segments to align properly and uh, proper hailing. So if there is not a uh, there is a 50-50 contact in between those two fragments, so we have to definitely go for an internal fixators. Right. Okay, so we're back in uh, our main topic, that is a minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, maybe you have uh, tried this one <clears throat> and may have you have practiced, but um, to share my knowledge and share uh, and discuss about what is the principles behind this technique is I think it's really important for the young veterinarians. Uh, that is basically the minimum access to the bone through small skin incisions and the indirect reduction technique that we did, uh, did not involve direct manipulation of the fracture. Uh, so you can even see that that's a small hole in between the both side of the fracture line and the relative stabilization of both uh, stabilization concept results in the indirect bone healing by callus formations. Uh, the appeal of this minimal invasive stabilization technique was not the small incision, not just the small incision, but the biological advantages such as a minimal soft tissue compromise, that is the main thing. And also it enabled uh, to undisturb or undisrupted fracture healing and uh, eventually it causes a fever infection rate complications um, compared to the open reduction and internal fixations using like a circlage wires plates during the early period of uh, fracture fixation. Right, uh, so this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, MIOs, MIOs, MIOs are not a very new concept to the orthopedic uh, field. Uh, human, in the human practices, they are using these MIPOs eventually, I mean, uh, re um, uh, frequently uh, to, uh, uh, as a cosmetic purpose, and also that uh, the advantages I have already mentioned for that, uh, that uh, concept. So I think it's uh, really important to use this technique to our practices and improve uh, your day-to-day uh, -day orthopedic uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, clinical assist. I think it's really uh, not a hard thing, but I will just uh, go uh, slowly to tell you how to do this one. Uh, before that, I think it's better to give us some history and evolution, how the minimal invasive uh, plate uh, osteosynthesis is uh, coming to our mind. Um, okay, so that's a second question is ready to y'all. Uh, this is, 
what are the theoretical and practical principle of rigid internal fixations? Because we are thinking about the internal fixations in the minimal invasive osteosynthesis. I'm just asking what are the theoretical and practical principle? What is the uh, rationale of using internal fixators? So I will raise it out only for three answers. So you will get a 10 marks for that. Okay, so why we using uh, these internal fixators is basically it reduces the anatomical uh, anatomical and it's coming to the proper anatomical locations, and it's rigid the fragments. Uh, and also the most important thing is is preserve the vascularization of bone fragments. So if you couldn't uh, get that answer, just uh, just write it down. I mean that could be very interesting, important to understand the basic uh, phenomena of using this internal fixation. So direct healing of the bone is a very desirable and it should be uh, the most fundamental resource or fundamental outcome or final outcome uh, as a as a surgeon. Uh, so once we apply these plates and the screws, uh, it should be very uh, uh, nicely, it should be healed in a nice way. Uh, I will say that a very interesting thing to you to understand, the fracture union without visible callus formations, what that means? fracture union without visible callus formation. So uh, we are thinking that when there is a callus formation around the bone, I think we are, okay, that's very nice to see that callus. But in certain level, it's not good actually because excess callus uh, should be considered detrimental and regarded as a kind of keloids of the bone. Um, so any radiographically visible callus formation during the fracture healing after internal fixation was regarded as a that's a kind of like a warning that should initiate the appropriate action. So remember that one. Uh, even we are happy with the, a lot of callus uh, formation after the surgery. I think the ideal way is union without radiologically visible callus. On the other hand, appear to be the most desirable form of healing. So the healing of a fracture without callus could be a regarded as a radiologically evident of continuous rigid fixations. All right, okay, so keeping that in your mind, so we will move next slide. So as I explained at the very beginning, the preservation of blood supply uh, to the uh, bone segment is really important when you are applying those plates, screws in a whatever fashion. It may be a minimal invasive or a direct opening the fracture sites and applying the plates. So you have to consider about the preservation of blood supply. So therefore, the careful handling of the tissue, soft tissue during surgery is really, really necessary. Um, that is why uh, this minimal invasive plate osteosynthesis is coming to our topic and come into this field and people are more considered about this technique, uh, basically thinking about these two factors, preservation of blood supply and careful handling of the tissue, soft tissues. So a good example is here, you could see that, you can see that how the plate, uh, the touching the bone and how it uh, can visualize in the histopathology, uh, the plate where the bone touched in a tight manner, they, they are compromised that a lot of blood at vessels here and uh, starting uh, we call this as a temporary porosis uh, it's like uh, in, uh, viability has gone in this area when compared to the other area so that is how it's end up with when you are putting a tight uh, fashion way the plates and screws so very fast the third questions uh, came into the slides uh, this is about um, okay uh, what is the direct reduction and what is the indirect reduction? So I will give a 30 seconds to write it down and you can give your mark by yourself. What is direct reduction and what is the indirect reduction?
Okay, I will show the answers. A direct reduction is uh, we expose the fracture uh, directly manipulating different fragments by instruments. So that means we are visualizing the fracture and involve. So that is we call the direct reduction. And the indirect reduction is the other way. So without opening the fracture zones, the technique, uh, usually we are combining the uh, minimal invasive fracture correction. So that is how the, uh, the history uh, and uh, that is how the uh, uh, evolution of this technique come into this field. So uh, by using the indirect reductions, we try to minimize the soft tissue injury and we try to preserve the blood supply to the fracture sites. All right. So these are the principles of minimal invasive plate osteosynthesis. Uh, there is no extensive surgical approach, keeping that in mind. So that means maybe surgical time is less. Um, there is no longer period of exposure to the outside. Uh, actually, it's a very easier than the normal uh, direct uh, approach. Um, small plate insertion incisions are made at the each end of the fractured bone. And also epiperiosteal tunnel connecting the incision is created. So I will explain how we do that one. That is the most important thing in this uh, technique uh, to making an epiperi uh, epiperiosteal uh, tunnel. The screws are applied at the proximal and distal end of the plate. Um, the good thing is they have a limiting uh, surgical dissections. Uh, you don't need to cut all length of the fractures and involving uh, to do the uh, corrections. There's a limited surgical dissections. There's no disruption of the fracture hematoma because hematoma carry lots of lot of cells, a lot of growth factors, a lot of cytokines, and there are several proteins which helps to um, uh, healing process, starting the healing process in a fast manner. Especially they carried a uh, lot of uh, stem cells. It's coming from the bone marrow. Uh, so that facilitate fast healing of the bone. If we disturb that hematoma, that uh, could be a delaying uh, the process of healing. And also less disruption of the periosteal blood supply as mentioned earlier. So that is a good point about this minimal invasive place osteosynthesis. Open, but do not touch, right? That's a good statement uh, for every one of us. The standard open approach is performed but the region of the fracture is not disrupted during the plate application. So uh, we are not going to anymore to touch the plate, to touch the fractured place, but we apply the, uh, the particular implants. The importance of uh, preserving osseous vascularity during the plate applications become evident. So these days, um, that is why the, uh, this technique is very famous and very popular in uh, human practices. Uh, even we can uh, start it off uh, very quickly. So this approach mitigates the disturbance of the fractures like hematoma, periosteum, and a regional musculature favoring, favoring finally, that's our most important outcome, early fracture healing, right? So we will move uh, first case. Uh, I just got it from uh, some reports. Uh, it's not my case. Uh, this is the humerus where they uh, make a proximal insertion or incisions preferred by blunt in dissections and deep in the deltoid and brachialis muscles. Uh, so they first uh, reduced the fracture by indirectly and then insert this uh, open into the, the proximal side. The tunnel is extended. So you could see that the tun tunnel is extended distally uh, to top proximal by carefully inserting the long straight um, scissors or you can use the uh, forceps under the brachialis muscles until the tip of the scissor is seen in the proximal insertion incision. Then the bone plate is inserted percutaneous to the tunnel and you can fix it with the uh, appropriate size of screws. So that is a basically the first case I just want. So that means you can use it in a way, wherever possible, like the humerus, it be femur, tibia, radius, uh, wherever you could uh, can do that in uh, indirect reduction. So you can easily apply this technique. So this is a tibia where they have a fracture in a sort of like a distal area. Uh, they already have uh, reduced it by indirect manipulation. I think it's not a very difficult thing to do, such a this kind of fracture. 
and then they make a small incision under either side and run the make the avenue to the plate and run the plate along the border of uh, the bone after that so they make a small incisions uh, here and there and we didn't even open the fracture site but uh, insert the screws and tighten it to the bone so uh, e even it is very clear that we are not disturbing here the fracture at all and also minimal exposure to the wound so this is a third case where they have used the external fixator to fix it up uh, before uh, applying the the plate uh, we don't have this, but if uh, in in some certain hospitals where they are very, very equipped, so they you could they can use these external fixators to fix the fracture segments uh, in a proper place and then insert the uh, plate, uh, making a tunnel as I explained earlier, uh, to run the plate uh, in a proper manner, and then uh, tighten the screws. This is another case. This is a case four coming from VTH. It's uh, we have used this one uh, to reduce the fracture without uh, making a big incisions, but we put a small three incisions along the uh, area and put the uh, plates on the proper place. See, this is a very challenging area where uh, you have to use the uh, indirect reduction uh, to blind reposition the fragments. Sometimes we use blindly and also perform without the direct fragment manipulation. Uh, maybe you have to open, uh, then close, and then or you can do it percutaneously, uh, aligning those fragments. Uh, reduction assessed by imaging or anatomical relationships. Uh, by uh, the surgeon's experience. Maybe you have to use the radiograph, quick radiograph to ensure that it is in the uh, correct positions um, uh, and uh, to start off your the next step. This is, a, I'm sorry for uh, this blurred image, uh, the sequences of fracture reduction. Uh, basically, when we have when we get this kind of a fracture, what we have to be, uh, have to do uh, at the initial step, as an initial step, is a traction. So you make a traction in this uh, segment and then increase the deformity uh, by angling both segments. And then you have to do is is a reverse deformity. I think you have a, this experience when you are reducing uh, this kind of fractures. Uh, maybe you have to do it in open manner or indirectly. And then final step is three-point bending fashion and stable the fracture. So this is a sequence of fracture reductions to achieve it in a line position. So as I explained earlier, this is the most challenging part, the creating of the epi peri tunnel, tunnel uh, through these small incisions we are making distally and up to the proximal opening. Um, so, uh, so the very um, most important and critical thing in this technique is appropriate care selections. That is a very crucial to success of the minimal invasive plate osteosynthesis. As with any techniques, not all fractures are amenable to percutaneous plate stabilization. Although MIPOs uh, is most applicable to comminuted diaphyseal or the metaphyseal fractures. Remember, comminuted diaphyseal or the metaphyseal fractures, which may not be uh, amenable to anatomical reductions, the technique can be utilized in uh, some simple transverse fractures. Although uh, this technique can be applied to the proximal limb fractures, we have found that femoral and uh, humoral fractures are typically more challenging to reduce using indirect techniques than uh, antibrachial or crucial fractures. Uh, femoral and humoral fractures may be amendable to MIPOs after using intramedullary pin. Remember that you can use intramedullary pin uh, or femoral distractors or retractors tables to achieve reduction and alignment of the fracture. So available, you, according to your availability of those instruments, you can uh, arrange something to reduce this factor, uh, the fragments uh, in an indirect method. Right, okay. Okay, so this is uh, Fourth questions, uh, I think this is just a small, very uh, basic one, but just to uh, refresh your memory about this, uh, just label uh, the fragments. I will give a uh, 15 seconds. I think it's more than enough. Just try it out. 
What is A? What is a B, C, D? Okay, so I hope you all, uh, you all got the answers. It's not a very uh, big one, but I just put it to refresh your memory. So A is a diaphysis, then metaphysis, epiphysis, and this is where the growth plates are located in the young animal. This is from a very uh, young animal uh, where you could uh, basically the growth plates. All right, okay, so I'll just move on to that uh, real uh, practical aspect. Uh, you have to okay imagine the fracture is on the femur mid of the femur and already align it in a proper manner so then we are going to open uh, from the proximal side uh, maybe three to five inches is enough uh, distal to the greater trochanter of the femur and then uh, you have to incise and go through the superficial and deep leaf of fascia lata along the cranial board of biceps femoris muscles to expose the proximal part of the femur um, uh, across the uh, bicep femoris muscles and after palpation of the patella uh, you could see that red color line here uh, lateral trochanter uh, ridge two to four inches i mean centimeters longitudinal skin incision is more than enough and beginning at the level of the patella and extend it until the proximal uh, distance after that, it's the same practice. So retract the vastus lateralis muscles, cranial, and the biceps femoris muscles cordially to expose the distal femoral metaphysis. Right. Okay. So this is the next step uh, where you have to make a periosteal tunnel to create it from the distal to the proximal by carefully inserting the long soft tissue elevator or you can use the medicine bomb scissor or available uh, uh, straight uh, forcep under the biceps femoris and vastus lateralis muscles until the tip of this instrument is seen through the proximal incisions. So believe me, it's not a very big task, but uh, maybe at the very beginning, it could be very challenging. But after that, you realize it's not a very hard thing because you are no, I, I mean, you don't need to worry about uh, blood vessels over there because you are going uh, along the border of those um, uh, under the muscles of bicep femoris and vastus lateralis. So it's no longer to worry about the uh, rupture of vessels or anything else. Okay, so we are coming into the most ending part of our presentation. Uh, so let me uh, summarize the advantage of MIPOs. Before that, I will give you a chance uh, to just list it down what you understand in the presentations. Uh, what are the advantages of MIP, MIPOs? Just list it down. I will give you 30 seconds. So you know that uh, as with the most techniques, uh, there are both advantages and disadvantages associated with MIOPs, MIPOs. Um, uh, so what are the, okay, I hope you are ready. Uh, basically the operating time is less. Uh, as I mentioned, it's very, I mean, quick surgery. Uh, only thing is you have to make those tunnels and uh, set the plates and the screws. Uh, other than that, it's uh, not a big, I mean, taking a lot of time. Um, operation time is reduced compared to the anatomical uh, reconstructions once the family with the procedure is developed and minimal invasive procedures carries less risk uh, of bacterial infections in comparison to the other open reconstruction procedures due to the shortened duration of surgery and also less tissue trauma. You could visualize it's a less actually zero tissue trauma. I mean, except uh, that in the small skin incisions in each side. The fracture hematoma is not removed at all at the surgery and maybe contribute to increase the rate of callus formation. And fracture stabilization with the MIPOs should heal in a similar manner of fracture stabilization with the external skeletal fixators, uh, but would require less patient uh, and fixator care in uh, post-operative and convalescent period. That's a very important thing. 
right? I think you have a, uh, I mean, a, a kind of like a fair understanding about what are the advantage of my, I mean, my peers. Okay, so we will move to the uh, disadvantage because every technique has advantage and also some few disadvantages as well. So write it down. What are the major disadvantages? You you think about this. Uh, maybe uh, more than three, but I just listed here the three. You might uh, end up up with many. Okay, it's your time. All right, uh, there are some obvious disadvantages associated with MIPOs. Uh, the technique can be technically challenging uh, to learn and apply. But I think uh, with these uh, sessions, you could have get some uh, basic understanding and you can try it with uh, maybe initially with a Kadawa or uh, with a patient even. Um, minimal invasive plate osteosynthesis may not be suitable for simple fractures and articular fractures which require precise anatomical reduction and compression. So keeping that in your mind, you can't apply this technique to all the fractures uh, you are come across in the long bone. Um, there are some limitations. Uh, and also MIPOs does not allow direct <clears throat> visualization. So you can't see because we are not opening the fracture sites. Uh, so you can't directly visualize the fracture sites so therefore, access to the intraoperative, uh, maybe uh, fluoroscopy or radiograph uh, is really needed. So that technique is you needed. But if you are confident with that reductions, I think you can, uh, you don't need to worry about it, bother about it. You can go ahead with this MIPOs. Right. Uh, if you get uh, such a, um, I mean, experience, please share with me in the future. I'm going to give you a take home message and uh, wrap up the uh, whole session uh, in this manner. I think uh, this is kind of like uh, MIPOs, as I explained, it's not a new technique, uh, but it's a good concept starting from uh, very, uh, I mean, a uh, few decades ago. Uh, but now it's very popular among human and now it's coming to the animal practices as well. Uh, a lot of practitioners are using this technique. Uh, there are some uh, pros and cons, disadvantages and advantages over the MIPOs. You have to make sure that the main thing is uh, minimal tissue injury and proper blood supply to the particular side to make sure that you have a allowing it to fast healing. So that is a basic uh, principle of applying the MIPOs. Um, and it's a promising and safe treatment uh, alternative for uh, community fractures. Um, and also that decreases the uni union time by minimizing the disruption of soft tissues, like including a periosteum. And also that lowers the incidence of bone grafting, as well as the rate of uh, post-operative complications, because uh, if there is an ununion fact, eventually you have to end up with a bone grafting or adipose tissue grafting uh, to make sure you are facilitating a lot of cells to regrow the both uh, non-union fractures. So here, uh, that the risk of uh, incident of bone grafting is reducing and reduce the complications as well. And also the most important thing is, is preserve the vascular supply to the fracture sites. Right, so those are the messages I want to give you uh, from all uh, the, uh, the session. Uh, and also I want to say that uh, though it's a further studies are needed to improve this technique, uh, this method has been proven to be a promising one. So I wish uh, you could try this one and uh, share the knowledge with others. Um, I hope you all get some idea about these sessions. And if you have any questions, you can ask me. Uh, and also, um, so you can uh, uh, scan this uh, logo. Can you see this one? If you have a smartphone, you can scan this and you can get uh, my email address through here. Uh, if you have any questions regarding this technique or if you want to share your practices with uh, me, please share that uh, and send me the email. Thank you very much. Uh, Tarindi, it's your time. I mean, if anybody has questions, we can answer it now. <clears throat> well, that was an interesting and really interesting and comprehensive lecture, madam. 
I must thank Dr. Suranji Vijay Korn on behalf of Sri Lanka Veterans Association for her valuable time and dedication to enlightening us on minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. Now it is time for questions and answers. You can unmute your microphone uh, and ask questions directly from Madam or type on the chat box and I will be directing to Madam. So questions are welcome. Dr. Suranji. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Susan. Ah, oh, no, sorry, Dr. Sugat. Yeah, it's a nice presentation. Thank you for new technology. Yeah. Uh, how can we use it for commutated fractures? Are there any possibility? Uh, commuted, yes, uh, we can use that one. The first thing is uh, there are a lot of fragments uh, in the fracture sites. Uh, yeah. The main thing is you have to stable the, the rest of, I mean, uh, uh, the proximal and distal fragments in the uh, uh, same line. And uh, I think uh, this is ideal technique for commuted fractures because rather than opening the site, because we can't do nothing, even we open, yes. we have to stable that one. Uh, the main thing is we have to stabilize the uh, distal and proximal ends. Um, but maybe you have to uh, get another X-ray while you are, uh, I mean, uh, aligning those segments. And then perhaps uh, what you can do is you can run a, uh, run an intermediary pin at the very beginning and then you can make a small holes in the proximal and distal lens and run make the avenue to the plates and run the plates and then fix the tube um, plates into the bonds um, maybe you can keep that pin as well but even you can remove that as well after because the main purpose of uh, putting that intermediary pin is to stabilize the both segment. Uh, I think uh, this is ideal technique for that sort of uh, commutated fracture, especially in the femurs or the humerus, uh, because we are ending up a lot of complications if we just uh, run on the intermediary pin. But if we can combine these uh, both techniques, uh, I mean, in, uh, the plate and the pins, we can stable it in a nice manner. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, madam, there's a, uh, madam, there's a oh. question from Dr. Ravi. Uh, he asks your views on MIPO and use of C arms image intensifier, please. Uh, and See, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. That's why uh, that's a kind of disadvantage for the uh, the that, uh, early beginning or the early career of uh, some uh, practitioners because they don't have that C arm radiograph imaging techniques. Uh, because you should have that uh, techniques to visualize whether you are aligning it properly. Because this is like some sort of uh, indirect reduction. Uh, that is the main purpose because we are not going to open the fracture site. Uh, for that purpose, we have to have uh, some sort of idea about uh, lining, proper lining. Uh, we definitely, maybe we have to have a CM radio um, technique to visualize it in a proper manner. Um, uh, imagine if you don't have that one. So what you can do is align. So uh, be confident, uh, whatever cases you are selecting. That is why I'm telling uh, continuously that uh, appropriate case selection is a crucial to the success of MIP. So if you are confident enough to select that particular case to attend with the MIPOs, I think you can go uh, without uh, CM radiograph techniques or fluoroscopy or something like that. Uh, but uh, you just uh, indirectly reduce the fracture and uh, start off your uh, uh, technique. Yeah, he has mentioned about the uh, case selection is important. Is exactly, yeah. Once you get the proper, I mean, a good case, I think uh, you can start off, yeah. Someone is asking question. Dr. Subhanji, I have a question uh, because yes, Dr. Subhanji. I'm not a uh, clinician, but uh, just for my understanding uh, that when you uh, fix this plate, I can see some of the uh, pins or, or the screws are 
protruding from other side of the bone will that create a uh, uh, complication to the dog uh not really unless it's uh, going beyond the skin and it's uh, goes outside i think it's not a big harm at all uh, usually what we are recommending is uh, you can pierce i mean you can go through the periosteal side of the other side of the bone i think it's not uh, harm at all um it not cause uh, many problem because we have done uh, i mean in in here even in here and over in other 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 hospitals we 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 came across such a uh, images but uh, we never had a complications with such a penetrations right thank you Any more questions from the audience? Uh, this is uh, Dr. Ravi Raithuk from uh, Veterinary College, Shimoga, India, ma'am. Doc, very nice presentation. And Thank uh, you. I have done few orthopedic operations, uh, ORIF and a uh, few MIPO also. And as you said, it's a, it's a huge uh, learning curve. And uh, it takes uh, some time to understand, uh, unless you have done an open reduction and internal fixation, uh, it is difficult to directly uh, do a MIPO. And I still at times find very difficulty in doing MIPO. I have attempted few in uh, radius ulna fractures. So uh, though, though I have a CM, but uh, at the, most of the time it is not functional. So I do a pinning for ulna so that I get an alignment do a lateral approach to ulna, put a pin, IMP, and then you get an alignment and a cranial plating on the radius. So, uh, however, uh, as far as humerus and uh, femur are concerned, I have always faced difficulty. Maybe uh, you are still yet to learn. And it also depends on the duration of fracture, actually. Is it a fresh case or is it a two-week-old case? The more older, uh, more difficult it is. And uh, the main, main difficulty is the alignment, actually. So at the end of the day, when you put a plate, the alignment is most important. So very nice presentation, Doc. It was my PhD work, actually, MIPO. Ah, but in, in my 2016, I happened to interact with Dr. Bruno Piron also. He had come to India. So I realized uh, I was not using a uh, destruction device, as you showed, one for uh, radius alna. So I still feel, though with a PhD, still I'm not an appropriate authority on MIPO. I most of the time do ORIF only. So thank you, Doc. Uh, it was very nice uh, hearing from you and uh, refreshing my knowledge about the principles of MIPO and the uh, fracture fixation. Thank you. God bless. And keep sharing your knowledge. And thanks to Sri Lanka Veterinary Association for allowing me to join uh, for this webinar. Some of my students from the college, Shimoga College, have also joined. Thank you. God bless. Thank Take you, care. Dr. Ravi. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravi, for your nice uh, explanation on the fracture repair. We will contact you later. And furthermore, if you have any further questions and queries, please contact Madam through her email. Uh, she will be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, still you can share the email ID on the screen. It would be good. Otherwise, how do we contact you? Do we just Google your name? All right. Okay. I will just uh, put uh, in yeah, chat you, box. You can Google my name. You'll find me. Similarly, I think if I can Google your name, we will reach somewhere. Or if okay. you can put it on the screen, it will be easier. Thank you. All right. I, I put in a chat box. Oh yes, fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Suraj, madam. There's a uh, there's a comment on. Uh, thank you for interesting presentation and nice presentation, madam.
Dr. Surangi. Yes. Yeah, uh, I have a uh, question. Uh, how can normally for the humerus radius and all the fibula fractures, uh, we have to assess the uh, angle of the fracture by using that um, boards, right? For the, yes. uh, the plate, right? Uh, yeah. So how can we do that with this method? Yeah, that's what uh, in my even presentation I mentioned that uh, it's uh, really, really important to select the uh, case. Um, basically, uh, this is more applicable to commuted uh, diaphyseal or metaphyseal fractures. But uh, if you are, I mean, uh, thinking about making something like angular side, I think we have to make more consideration, as you said, that we have to think about uh, uh, angles especially uh, when it comes into the distal part of uh, or the more near to the joints. I think it's very important to select a proper case to uh, attend these sort of uh, cases, uh, but this, this, this sort of a technique. Um, so that's why I'm recommending it's better to uh, think about the diaphyseal or metaphyseal fracture rather the, rather going for an angular area, because uh, if, when it is go for the angular area, you have to think about the angles you are mentioning. Uh, and maybe it could be a little trouble to stabilize in a proper angle and in a level align in a proper manner. So it all depends on the case selections, Dr. Uh, who's that? Yeah. Yeah, so good, yeah. Dr. Thank, Sudha, you. thank you. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I really? mean, we will bend the plate according to the uh, bone uh, angle. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So you you mean that bending that bending? Yeah, you yeah, can do that. You yes, can do that. Plate. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question, uh, especially when it comes into the uh, most proximal part of the tibia. So better you have to have a, some sort of angle. Um, that is why we have to have a proper uh, avenue or the tunnel to pass uh, this angulated uh, plate through this uh, tunnel. Um, so when I uh, I did the last, uh, I did a once it in, the, in our VTH, so at that time even we have uh, did the angulations of the plates and we ran it through the tunnel. I think it's not a very big trouble, but only thing is you have to have idea about this uh, angulations and uh, I mean, uh, turning it in a proper manner according to the bone structure, but passing it through the tunnel is not a big issue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So you have uh -huh. to do that plate contouring in very well uh, before you insert into the uh, bone shaft. Thank you okay. very much, Dr. Sagar. Yeah. Madam, we are having another question from Dr. Rian. Uh, please kindly mention the preferable fracture case. We are to go for MIPO. Uh, as, yeah, so as we discussed uh, in time time, I think it's very important if you can start off uh, from uh, a tibia or radius uh, fracture rather going for the humeral and uh, femur. Once you get experience, you can go uh, for that uh, long bones. Initially, you can try a, a tibial fracture or radius or a fracture uh, uh, with uh, where the location of, especially in the metaphyseal area or diaphyseal area. So I think it's uh, then it is easy more to uh, you to practice on these locations and go beyond the levels and start off in uh, most advanced places. Any more questions, Tarindi? Um. Uh, yes, madam, most of them are very impressive on your lecture. Uh, still, we don't have getting new questions. Uh, I think it's time to conclude the session of questions and answers. I must thank Dr. Suranji Vijaykon, our guest speaker, once again for her valuable lecture and all, also my enthusiastic and supportive audience as well. Uh, I would like to invite the Honorary Secretary of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, Dr. Ch Chamari Kannangara, to proceed with the rest of the session. Over to you, Dr. Chamari Kannangara. Thank you. 
thank you very much, Dr. Tarindi. Uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Suranji Vijaykon, uh, today's speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Th Th uh, uh, Suranji, for your very informative presentation. I'm sure all who joined today must have gained a very good knowledge about MIPO technique. So thank you again, Dr. Suranji, for accepting our invitation and uh, doing this uh, great presentation. It's very uh, nice presentation with a lot of colorful pictures and uh, real uh, photographs. So thank you very much, Doctor. And thank next you very much, uh, SAVA committee, and especially Dr. Chamari, Dr. Sugat, Susanta, and all the team members for organizing such a very uh, in, uh, interesting series of webinars. I, I had a chance to attend a few uh, previously. I think they are very informative. I think for the young veterinarians, they, they are getting a lot of information for through these uh, sessions. Uh, thank you again for inviting me and having me today. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suranji. And next, uh, I must thank uh, today's moderator, uh, Dr. Tharindi Ma Ma uh, Madhivela. Thank you, Dr. Tharindi. Thank you for accepting our invitation and be volunteer to do the uh, moderator role today. Uh, you have done it uh, very perfectly and thank you very much uh, again. And next, uh, I would like to thank our uh, president, uh, Dr. Susanta Malavarachi, and our executive committee members, all the executive committee members, for their continuous support given to conduct this webinar series. And uh, finally, I must thank the audience, uh, those who have joined from Sri Lanka and also those who have joined from other countries, especially from India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, and also from other countries. Thank you very much for joining uh, with us today. Uh, and I hope all of you have gained a very good knowledge and good experience about uh, minimally invasive placed osteosynthesis technique. Uh, and I, I would like to invite all of you to join our next webinar uh, that will be on 17th June, that is next Friday. Uh, the topic is surgical intervention for congenital malformations in calves under welfare perspectives. So that will be a large animal uh, presentation. And our resource person will be Dr. Damika Pereira. He is also from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University of Peradeni. Uh, and also those who have uh, missed uh, today's webinar, uh, they can watch the uh, webinar later. Uh, by uh, logging into our website, SLVA uh, website or our uh, Facebook page. Uh, so uh, thank you very much again and I wish uh, all of you will join our next webinar. Thank you.